Maybe it was Edward Snowden's revelations about government mass surveillance that made you realise it. Or maybe it was the Cambridge Analytica scandal and what that tells us about the threats to our ability to make proper collective decisions in elections. Or maybe you've even read Sushana Zubov's book, Surveillance Capitalism, from back to front, in which case, well done. But whichever way you got here, the fact you are here makes me think that you understand, like we do, that the, mass, that the collection of personal data at a massive scale is one of the most profound problems we face as a society today. The advent of big data means that governments and large corporates may know more about you, or probably know more about you, than you know about yourself, in some ways. And as Edward Snowden has recently pointed out, the generation growing up today is going to be growing up with an indelible personal record, permanent personal record, of everything they've ever done, out there, not owned by them. And maybe most worryingly, the pairing of big data with machine learning algorithms means that large organizations can make inferences and decisions about you which really affect your life in ways that you really have very little influence over at all. That's the problem. And what we're really talking about here today is what we're going to do about it. And specifically, it is us owning and then being able to sell our own personal data the way forward. These are political and philosophical questions, not just technical ones. And we're not starting from ground zero here, because I guess if you look at the history of the internet, there are some sort of strains of thought which gives us some interesting perspectives on this issue. Um, I'm really going to have to apologize for what follows, because this is a really um, bold gen generalization of some quite sophisticated streams of thought. So I'm really, really sorry, but it's about all I can do on this Thursday evening. Um, so the first perspective is what I'm going to call the open, open government or data commons perspective. And this kind of holds that the more information that's out there, the better, because we can, with more information, we can make better decisions. So we want to add more information to the commons, make it available to people to do ingenious things with it, and we'll know more as a society. It's sort of a liberal utopian idea. The second main perspective is the one which is advocated by, by, by people who are in, more interested in privacy. And this approach looks at um, areas which should be, which should be um, fenced off from the commons, kept, kept, kept to itself in the interests of personal autonomy, family life, and the ability of societies to make collective decisions. A more technological version of that sort of privacy idea is, um, is sort of the cypherpunk idea, which sees the wide availability of personal data as a massive problem. A massive problem and one that's actually kind of unavoidable because everything on the internet is absolutely and irretrievably broken in ways that you cannot even imagine. And because everything is broken in ways you cannot even imagine, we have to look at a project which is furthering human liberty through the application of mathematics, i.e. encryption. This is a kind of libertarian idea, of course. And historically, it's been, it has at times been slightly antagonistic towards the state, and the state has been highly antagonistic towards it, which was very obvious on Monday at um, Westminster Magistrates Court during um, Julian Assange's preliminary extradition hearing there. All of this sort of philosophical stuff can be quite confusing. And maybe there is, maybe there is a way through it. And I think that's what we're going to discuss today. Because applying property rights to this area to solve this problem, in some ways, is quite attractive. It suddenly takes an area which is quite confusing and puts it into a realm where we're quite familiar. Because even if we don't like, we don't always like the institutions of, liber of liberal democracy, we're quite familiar with them and how they work. So um, should we tell our data? Is that something people actually want? How would it work? And does it lead us to a better place than we are today? I am hugely privileged, and I guess so are you, because you're gonna listen, listen to them, to be in the room with um, a panel who can really shed some light on this from a whole host of different perspectives. Um, from my left is Carl Miller from Demos, Renata Sampson from the Open Data Institute, 
um, Valentina Pavel, um, former Mozilla Follow at Privacy International, and Shiv Malik, who I used to know from The Guardian and is now working for Streamer. Um, so I think I'm going to turn to Renata first, who has done, taken a sort of novel approach of talking to actual people about what they, about what they think about all this. And I was wondering, um, what, what's, um, I'm wondering if you could tell us about your research, which you did in association with this institution that we're sitting in right now, and um, what are people's genuine intuitions about data and how they want it to be used? Thank you. Uh, thank you for a stimulating uh, introduction to uh, this event. Um, yeah, so first of all, the Open Data Institute, what's that all about? Well, uh, it's about open data, encouraging uh, data to be open whenever possible, but it's not quite as uh, uh, liberal as all of that. We have a very useful um, uh, thing called the data spectrum, which indicates when data should be open, when data should have access to be shared, uh, and when data should be closed. So there is still, um, and I'm a former privacy campaigner, so uh, it's two sides, arguably, of the same coin. It's about transparency. It is, as Naomi said, about making uh, as much value, opportunity, uh, innovation, uh, shared societal good experiences as possible out of data rather than holding hoarding data or even creating a data wasteland it's about finding that sweet point when data can have real real opportunity and value from it so that's a bit of a background to open data as stands now um, so the report that we did uh, is called About Data About Us, and it was done with uh, the RSA and Luminate and the ODI, and it was published um, at the beginning of September. And what we did was we spoke to about 50 people. Yep, a pretty small number, and yes, they were all from the greater London area, although uh, they were, as we all know, London's a massive melting pot of people from all over the world. There was representatives of people from all over the place, all different ages, all different political backgrounds, and all different levels of knowledge with with, uh, engagement with the internet. So what did they tell us? Well, we went in as a starting point to talk about can you own data or should it be about rights and responsibilities about data? And what was really interesting, and I'm gonna put this out there right at the very, very start because we've heard already that it's our data. We would argue, and indeed the people that we spoke to argued, there's no such thing as my data or our data. It is data about us. And that means that, for example, right now, uh, my location data is your location data. We're all sat here together. If anyone's going to take a photo, that photo is not of me. It's of everybody on this panel or everybody in this room. Uh, our DNA is about all of our family, even people we don't know are our family. And often people are finding out that their dads aren't their dads uh, after doing their uh, 23andMe swab test. Um, your health data is not just about you. Your banking data is not just about you. Your Amazon search history is probably about presents you've wanted to buy for other people. And every time you do a Google search, it's probably not just about you. So how can we then sell data about us if it's not just about us, would be my starting point. Anyway, we spoke to 50 people. We started with the can you own your data? And a couple of people put their hands up and went, yeah, absolutely, most definitely, I can own my data. And everybody else in the room went, ha, 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 no, you can't. And there was this fascinating discussion. I genuinely couldn't believe that it was at the point that it was at because we've all spent quite a long time, policymakers and so on, assuming that people uh, don't give two monkeys about data, that they don't understand it, that they're complacent about it, and they will willy, willingly give it away for 10% for, uh, off whatever. And actually, we found that's not how people feel. People don't believe they own their data. People don't believe that it is their data. People don't even believe that they own the things that they buy online, telling us that music that they bought was actually just being licensed to them and they were annoyed when it was taken away. And one of them quoted Bruce Willis having a massive row with Apple about his music collection. So we also talked about rights and responsibilities and people felt that that actually sat a bit better, uh, that there are rights and responsibilities and everyone we spoke to said that they knew what the GDPR was and some of them had used it and they felt that that was a much better starting point than trying to derive value from data because if you can't own it, how do you get value from it? And indeed, we had people say, what is value? To me, it's worth X amount emotionally or financially if you want to try and put a price on it. To my doctor, 
butter, it's worth something else. To the shop around the corner, or whatever, the, on the high street, it's worth something else. To my mates, that photo of that beautiful moment at their baby's christening was, is worth something else. So value in itself was complicated. Um, we also, and forgive me, I'm going to swear, uh, we heard one person say, trying to get your data back off the internet is like taking piss out of a swimming pool, which for me is quite a choice expression. It actually features in our report. And everybody around the table laughed and couldn't really get their head around it, but agreed. Yes, what do we do? As soon as we put data about us out there, we lose any t entitlement or concept of ownership. It's replicated, it's screenshotted. Even one person said to us if they did feel like they could sell their data or if they could control their data, it happens all the time that you don't know who's using it and for what purpose. So I'm blathering quite a lot, but as an overview, the, 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 the general principle that we heard from the people that we spoke to was that you can't own data about you. All right. I'm going to move on to Carl, who um, has some insights for us on like, how, much do you, how much do we even understand about the way our, our data is used? Nothing. We, un we understand absolutely nothing about where our data is or where it exists. All right, so hello, everyone. Very good evening. I did something recently so incredibly boring so you don't have to. Now, you've all got powers under GDPR, very powerful, very important, and really quite dull law, to get your data back. Anywhere you, where you think it is, you can ask for your data back. And that is a legally binding request which a company has to fulfill, has to respond to. It's not your data. <laughs> you can ask for personal data about you back. <laughs> Already the barracking is beginning. Um, and I did. I worked with the BBC. I spent two months in an unbelievably tooth-pulling, frustrating process asking hundreds of companies for my data back so I could stick it together into what I fondly call my own data doppelganger. Now, that alone was pretty eye-opening. So one company asked me to send a physical letter to France to get my data back. It's an English company. Another company drew me into what I can only describe as a Kafkaesque labyrinth of online portals and logins where I needed to log in to get my data back but I couldn't log in so I phoned their support service who said I needed an account in before I could talk to them but I couldn't because I couldn't log in. And that kept going around and around and around and around. It was like this horrible kind of nightmarish kind of like mad, mad infuriating scene. But two months later I'd done my best. I was spent. I had pulled quite a lot of data back into my own data, data doppelganger. And what I found basically was this. There's a small amount of data about all of us, which we volunteer. And we know those companies. We send them an email. We, we scan our passport and send it to them. That's a small amount. That's the most visible amount. That's the most cogent. That's where you would first go to ask for your data back. Then there is more from companies and services that you use that probably collect data in some way about you, which you might not know, but it's kind of for the service. So Uber, you open the Uber app, and actually when Uber gave me my data back, it was thousands upon thousands upon thousands upon thousands of rows of GPS coordinates. Like pretty much every second I had that app open, it was, it was time stamping a GPS coordinate, and kind of it turned out to be a giant, a giant list. And you know, Amazon, they, they pretty much will record everything you ever do on your Kindle. Um, that's larger. It's, bit less visible, but you know, I mean, you still roughly have some kind of idea what's going on there. But the Alice in Wonderland of the data world was a whole kind of confectionery of data brokers, companies I'd never heard of at all, that had this third kind of data, kind of metadata, data that had been generated from other data about me. And that's really where it got truly strange. Suddenly, I learned that I'd been given an indulgence rank. And even more insultingly, I was considered the most indulgent 10% in society. I had like online segmentations, things like young and struggling, or idea aspirer, or romance seeker. I realized that I had actually, I've written a book, but I, I, unfortunately I learned from one data broker company that I have a 7% interest in reading, which is actually lower than the interest in my own grandchildren. Uh, I learned that my boiler, which I've never seen before, is probably under the age of five years old, and so on, and so on, and so on, and so on. There were, and it, all of this, is a pro m much of it was total garbage, to be honest with you, but all of it had this kind of pseudo-scientific tint of authenticity, given the decimal points that their probabilities were calculated down into. 
All of that stuff is being traded and compiled and enriched and bought and sold in an industry which is utterly outside of our visibility. These companies have no interest in us understanding what happens with that kind of data. Not, I think, because they are necessarily evil. They just we, we just aren't part of the sales cycle. We don't buy any of it. We don't use any of it. it we're the product, of course, and we've, we've been hearing that for ages, but we're not actually either really the client nor the user of anything that they do. Um, so, you know, I, I, I would come at this from just the, the kind of pragmatic despair that I'm not sure we have, would, even, if we, even if we had all these powers to sell today, I would have no idea like, where I, what I would do to begin to actually start clawing any of that back into a way which I can control. And a whole bunch of the stuff you're talking about doesn't come under data protection law anyway, does it? It's not, it's not personally identifying data. Um, no, it, 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 well... It, it is. It is yeah, personally it identifying. Is, yes. Yeah, I mean, th so this is, the, I mean, this is one of the awkward things um, about, so GDPR defines uh, personal data and uh, s special sensitive data. Um, personal data uh, it tends to be identifiers, um, but in there, there is location. Um, then there's, there's cookies as well, which is what gathers a lot of this. Um, where it gets complicated, and certainly what we did in the About Data About Us report, is that we try to define, because most of us don't really get it, we try to sort of break down the types of data there are about about us. So we've four types of data about us. The, the personal data, the identifier, your name, address, your location, your IP address, uh, cookies. Um, then special sensitive data, your gender, your race, your religion, your political affiliations, um, health uh, information, and others. Um, and then what we define as behavioral data, your likes, your dislikes, what's in your shopping basket, your search history, um, that sort of stuff, which is a lot of what Carl has been talking about. The stuff that's then used to buy and sell adverts uh, and time target and make decisions about us and is put into algorithms. And then societal data, the data that's traditionally always been gathered about us, stuff that is gathered in the census, which is about us, but the importance isn't about re-identifying us from it, it's about movements of, of society and people, and it's meant to help with good decision making, where schools should be built, where hospitals should be built, uh, uh, that sort of thing. And that's what most of us don't really think about. We're so freaked out now by all the behavioral stuff and the personal stuff that there is stuff about us that actually is good for society to think about, but the, inf the importance of that is not re-identifying us or making decisions about us as individuals, but making decisions about society as a whole. Brilliant. Thank you. Very helpful. Um, so, Valentina, I thought I, I thought I'd turn to you. Um, if we imagine a world in which you can o own your data, whether it's you know your data and whether you can own it, supervisors there. I mean, what what would what might that look like? Is it somewhere that we want to go? Is it good? Is it better than we are now? Well, I think that's for each and everyone to decide. Um, what I did as a Mozilla Fellow at Privacy International is look at different uh, data ownership models or different proposals that are associated with either owning in, in a property rights sense of view um, either or monetizing um, data or receiving payment for the data that you generate. And I believe there are many more options to, to explore. Uh, the exercise that I did is basically um, a speculative uh, writing, developing four scenarios, imagining how the world might look like, depending on the uh, different data models that we might choose. Um, the first one it tackles uh, data property. The second one uh, talks about um, seeing data as labor and receiving payment for it. Uh, the third one um, is a creation of, of a national data fund co-owned by both citizens and governments. And my favorite one is uh, describes a data rights uh, framework, uh, which I believe is the best candidate uh, for us all. There are lots of different arguments uh, that we can go into, both in terms of uh, property rights for data or data ownership, um, or data uh, monetization models. Um, but I think we should really start the discussion uh, asking ourselves what do we want to achieve uh, because it's very intuitive to feel angry and uh, hopeless and say oh, if big companies are making money out of the data that I generate, why shouldn't I get a piece of the pie? Why shouldn't I get paid for it? If we could just pause for a minute and take a step back and really look at the implications um, and the effects that will have on us as individuals, but also on collective level, maybe we 
I, I think that's, that's a much more healthy starting point. So what are we trying to achieve um, when we're talking about property rights or monetization models? Okay, and I think with that, that seems like the perfect introduction to, to get Shiv to explain to us what data unions are and what they do. Well, maybe I'll come in with something. Uh, actually, could I take the liberty of asking the audience a question, which is, we, maybe we should have done that. Go yeah, ahead. Audience engagement time. Um, hi. Uh, who believes that we should sell our data? And maybe we can come back at the end and see if anyone changes their mind. Hands up if you believe you should own and therefore sell your data. Ooh, good. Okay, in order to sell it, you're going to wow. have to, in a sense, <laughs> own it. Good, but good, good. Um, okay, who believes we should sell our data? Let's just go with that. No one. Two people. Two people, right. Oh, no, there's more. One, three. There's more, there's five. Uh, this is like a, an Six. auction. Eight. What, Do we have eight? Do we have eight? I okay. feel very shy about so, that. So, so not many. Okay, interesting. That's good. Let's see if this changes uh, at the end of the discussion. Let me start with something really high level then, which is that, look, I believe in um, modernity. What does that even mean? It means, I think very simply, I believe that the future should be better than the past. And actually we live in a time where that isn't necessarily true. We've seen lots of things go backwards. Um, and especially, most especially perhaps, the vision of what the internet should be. It started off as very rosy and it's ended up with this panopticon hell. So I feel like taking a step back and thinking about it a bit more is like the worst thing you could do at this point. I feel like action is absolutely needed and maybe that's just me, like very bullish. Um, but I feel like you know, people are getting away with massive, basically sort of crimes in, 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 in a way or another. Uh, and, and, and we're talking, having a very nice discussion about rights and how those rights are being trampled on, but we've got no real way to enforce those rights. So I come from the perspective of saying, do you know what stands most in, like there's an adage, right? Most of the law, nine tenths of the law is property, right? And I like that adage, and it's sort of true, right? A lot of the law is about property. So great, why don't we take our privacy concerns and put them back where they, I think they should belong, which is in property rights. The oldest form of kind of privacy in law was about very simple things. The king can't come and take my papers because they're in my house and I own the papers and I own my house. So no. And that was one of the earliest cases in English common law uh, to refuse, to, uh, to instantiate some sort of right of privacy. You can't come into my house, it's my house, I own it, therefore you can't come in. You can't do this, you can't see that, because I own these things. And I think the discussion at the moment has become, well look, we have this very interesting thing about privacy and people deserve, have a right to privacy, and they deserve not for things to be known. And that's great, and it really works actually for celebrities, because actually that's really where those very highfalutin discussions happen and have taken place and have like formed the law, but it's all media law. And I think, weirdly, we've tried to take some of that law and take it to things like data, and it hasn't really worked. And, I mean, strategically speaking, it's been an utter failure, because we've ended up in the place that we are now, which everyone on this panel, I'm sure, will agree is pretty hellish. So. I like the privacy uh, aspects being instantiated through property law. I, I think we need to get a place where we can say, this is my data and I can sell it. Now, none of that really makes sense unless you can actually do it. It's like, imagine if I said to you, uh, look, you've got your house, uh, great, um, but you've got no estate agents, you've got no monetary system, and you don't know what your neighbor's house worth, now go and sell it, right? You'd be like, oh, this is very difficult, and, and I'd say, how much is it worth? You know, tell me, quick, now, let's go, and you'd be like completely confused, and there's no lawyers, and there's no nothing. You need the infrastructure to make sense of ownership, and that's actually what we've been lacking. Businesses have plenty of infrastructure to be able to sell their data. That trade goes on, and it's worth billions. We all see it. We can look at anyone sort of major technical uh, 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 company sort of uh, books, and you'll see how much roughly their data is worth, and you know it's worth billions, because they have the infrastructure to own and claim, and they enforce their rights. You know that when you look at Twitter's rights and terms and conditions, they say, oh, you can't sell that data, because it's ours. They don't have a problem with claiming property rights, do they? They don't go, oh, well, is it ours? Oh, is it someone else's? No, it's theirs, and they'll sue you if you do anything else, right? So I like... Um, so I think they've made it very clear, and they have the infrastructure. So I think what we've done, uh, what Stream is attempting to do with data unions, is to set up infrastructure that applies to individuals. So it's the kind of thing that says, hey, if you want to get paid for this, great. 
if you want to, so we use the kind of, technically speaking, we use the OAuth system at this point to very simply uh, take data that's being created by you personally, let's say from your Twitter account, from using Google, from any number of social media accounts at the moment, and actually lots of other accounts like your Fitbit, for example. Great, copy that data, send it to another place, a third party, and that data is available for sale. And every time it sells, you get the money. And I think that's a really simple, nice model. And what backs us up, to end with that, is really nicely, is uh, GDPR. So the law backs us up with portability rules. No one really kind of knows Article 20. I don't know if you know Article 20. You've come across it yeah. yet. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's what you had to do. Of course do. I do. I know well, Article 20. Yeah, it's well, my favorite article. I know that knows Article 20. <laughs> so so it, it's the thing that I think has, hasn't been commercially exploited yeah. yet. I mean, it's, it's a new law, right? So um, that's the thing that says, basically, the companies have to help you move your data from their platform to anywhere else you select. And that's a really powerful tool. It's not been exploited yet by anyone in particular that I've seen. I don't know if you have better examples. Open um, banking. Open, open banking is, yeah, right. And um, I think customers are, are starting to see the fruits of that, actually, right? Because you can move your account quite easily. Um, but that was pre-GDPR, wasn't it? That was already before. You can carry on after the open banking. So now you can yeah. use, your, use your bank in, right. in different banks. So imagine that, the that, that rule then applying to social media platforms where you can then say, okay, well, look, I'm just going to take all of this and I'm going to deny you the right to sell it. That's very interesting. And I'm only going to sell it over here. And then you get a kind of functional uh, body who represents you in selling your data on your behalf. You don't have to think about it. You just get the money. You have to think about it a little bit. Anyway, that's the kind of rough conceptual basis. I, I don't know, I didn't know where I sat in this, but I think I've now decided I disagree with Shiv quite, quite a lot. And I, I, what, what makes me anxious is that if you turn a, a right into essentially a commodity which you have rights over, I become incredibly worried that essentially your ability to exercise that becomes a function of your market power. So people that can afford to, people that can act rationally in markets, inevitably can have greater control than people that can't. And, and it's kind of already happening. So, um, like, you guys don't need to know this, but, but you know, I mean, in very shady ways, um, we already live in a world where there are business models, two different kinds of business models buried into many of the devices that we use. Um, you know, the, the cheaper the device, the more likely that is kind of leaking data or has ulterior, ulterior business models um, to the ones that you buy it for. I mean, the, the best example of this, I bought a Hoover. My Hoover started like bumping and, and kind of humming its way around my kitchen floor. And then I realized after a bit, it was beginning to kind of triumphantly start chicaning around the the chair legs and, and, and accelerate into open spaces. And it was because it was learning my floor plan of my house. I hate hoovering and I bought one of those ones where it does it for you. Um, then when we, and this is another BBC investigation, when we hooked it up, we realized it was sending my floor plan to China. And then the webcam that we bought was sending what was something which we don't know to 43 hard-coded IP locations around the world. And then we found fairy lights, which were telling ad tech companies every time they were switched on or off. Now, what unites all of these different devices? They were all cheaper than the equivalents. They were all cheaper than ones which weren't doing that. So if you don't have a great deal of market power, you already lean towards those kinds of devices. And I, I kind of worry, like that's illicit in a way, and I kind of hope that over time, that kind of shady and covert and I think totally dishonest business model will, will gradually, with both consumer education and, and, and better enforcement of law, diminish. But, but I still worry that if we turn data into something you can simply buy and sell, there will be then some people who are already more knowledgeable, already richer, already um, less vulnerable, will be the people that essentially benefit from that more. I, well, there is an issue here about vulnerable people as well. Arguably, if, 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 Shiv's, if, you're, if the model that Shiv has put forward is, is to really work, we all have to be in, in it. We all have to be in it. All of us. Uh, otherwise, um, who needs the cash? And when does the value diminish? And what other data are we talking about? I mean, you know, 
we could have a big conversation now about facial biometrics, for example. Um, sell your face, and then your face is in a database being flogged. I mean, all right, your face is in a database already, but... If you, if you really need some money, 100 quid for your face is going to look pretty tantalising. Nobody would do that. Yeah. Uh, and then that one code of your face that you can't ever change because you can't change your face and facial and uh, plastic surgery is not going to make that much of a difference. Is, I mean, the, the point is, is what data are we actually talking about? To what value? To if you're really skin, if you're really hard up, what are you prepared to sell and how's that actually going to end up playing out for you? But arguably, I think this is much more about for the model to work, every Everybody has to be in it. And part of uh, 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 Valentina's paper, which I hope you'll now get to talk about, is the idea that if we were to be given a, um, uh, and I always forget the word, but basically uh, a, frame, a framework where all of our data is there, logged, our Facebook data, our Twitter data, our face data, our Roomba, uh, Hoover data, uh, whatever data it is, and it's there for us to go, you can have that, you can have that, I'll trade that bit now, I'll trade that bit here, there and everywhere. Who's going to own that? Is that going to be a private company you're going to allow to have that or are you going to get issued that at birth by government and then who's where's the protection around that where's the encryption uh, how do we act what control do we actually have other than the maintenance of how that works I mean I'm, I don't want to put I want you to actually tell that story because I think that that's a really fascinating part of your report actually I had five different points to, sh to Shiv's um, first uh, comment uh, I'll just give you three and maybe I'll, I'll come back to, to this um, but uh, the paper that uh, Renate is referring to is called Our Data Future and is available on uh, Privacy International's website. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't mention this at the beginning. Um, so quick three points on what Chiefs uh, um, um, commented uh, before. Let's start with something that I think we can all agree with. Uh, data that we share today, we might not be so happy that we, we shared it in the future. So privacy is a, is a time-shifted risk. Um, there are gov uh, authoritarian governments out there. I'm sure maybe some of you um, are familiar with uh, that model. I am for sure familiar with it, although I haven't lived in those times. Uh, I come from Romania, so it's a, f a former communist country. Um, and second point, if we start selling uh, or owning our data, uh, I think we can only own or sell the data that we directly generate, but there's also, there also comes the question of indirect data, the data that is being observed and predicted and inferred about us, so how do we deal with, with that? I don't think uh, a monetization or a property model really addresses this issue, which I think is fundamental. Um, and if we start designing uh, protocols uh, that uh, deal with um, transferring data, how, how about adding some human rights uh, elements to it? How about c creating those controls for accessing data, for correcting data, for moving data, um, and for, for managing uh, permissions and accesses? I mean, so is that a future project that you're yeah, interested in? Yeah, no, absolutely. To? Look, I mean, look, you can't, um, we, I think we draw inspiration in having designed this from uh, Jaron Lanier and Glenn Weil, who aren't stupid people. Um, they're right on one end of the spectrum. Uh, they'd do a much better job if they were here tonight. Um, I tried to fly him over, but he just, he was too busy. Um, and I think what their conception is, is a kind of uh, what they call MIDS. It's the same as data unions, uh, in that uh, it's just like a handy acronym for... Uh, mediators of individual data. Um, I don't know if anyone watched uh, Jared Lanier's thing for the New York Times, but it's sort of a three-part video thing, and it was uh, they're sort of five minutes each. They're really st very stimulating, uh, just on this topic, in fact. And the conception, therefore, of a data union is is that you know we don't just do this individually because it it is it's just not going to work if you know big data because you ask yourself who's going to buy this data right so let's say it's big companies out there who do want to who do want this information right and it is actually valuable and useful certainly at the meta level they're not going to come to each and every one of you uh, and sit there bargaining that's just never going to happen um, so you do have to in a sense club together create these kind of data fire hoses um, uh, which can be managed and then that starts when you get that professionalization that starts to I think answer some of those questions uh, and it allows you the space, I think, to create some of those systems. But what I feel like you're not acknowledging to start with is that we're in a really terrible place now. And we can do almost nothing 
that could be worse than where we are, right? Anything that moves us away from where we are is just much better because it's so horrible um, from both the privacy perspectives where huge governments and huge corporations know vastly more than I think that we know about ourselves. Um, you know, if all of us club together and try to figure out just one person's sort of information in this room just by chatting to them, we still wouldn't get anywhere near, I think, what corporations outside of this room would know about that one person. Um, I think, uh, so that's a terrible prospect. But then on top of that, you've got all of the inequalities that flow from that. And it isn't just, and let me identify two inequalities. First is the money. Everyone knows about that. Everyone knows that these huge Silicon Valley companies are rich. Uh, and they have not just billions, but trillions. And trillions is like a, a huge number. It's really difficult to get to terms with, but they're valued in, in, in that kind of field. Um, it was a fascinating thing. I think if you, if you earn $5,000 a day from the minute that Columbus landed in America, you would still not earn a billion dollars if you lived till now. So uh, that's just a billion, and a trillion is obviously a thousand times that. That was, so, a, that was a viral tweet. Yeah, it was, that was a beautiful number, I thought. And, and actually, I think you'd have to work for something like 8,000 years before you earn that. A $5,000 a day, who earns $5,000 a day in this room? No one, right? No one. Um, so, you know, that, so there's obviously economic inequalities, and that's all based on their, the fact that they know more about you. That's it. Um, they, well, uh, can, may I interrupt? Well, I was going to say one, your one last inequality yeah. here, which is this, and this is for me, I think, one of the most interesting and innovative aspects about removing the underlying data from innovation, which is, you know, when you have Google Maps, everyone basically has a couple of choices at the moment when they look for a map kind of app. Um, you have a Google Maps or you have Waze, right? Who, knew, who knows here, I don't know if anyone knows, who owns Waze? Google, right? Why? Because Waze tried to compete. It's really difficult to compete with Google. If you want to set up your own map application, you're going to have to have 10 million people or something like that before you can start to be a viable prospect against Google. That's really hard to get because everyone's like, well, why would I join this thing? It's rubbish, right? Because of network effects, fine. Then if the second thing, if you actually get there, what happens? Google just buys you. So what does it mean? You have lots of free apps, uh, every, uh, very few free app, apps, but they're free. So the comp competition commission doesn't intervene because they're like, well, they're all free, so no one's getting scammed here. But the innovation is minimal. And that, when you remove, and who's creating all of that information for Google? It's us, it's us, it's our location data. If you can remove that from there, then anyone can come along and build their own map uh, app if, on top of this uh, fire hose that we generate, or anything else, right? And then suddenly you don't get these monopolies anymore, and suddenly you have innovation, which I think is the innovation that people want, which is good ideas blossoming, and that's brilliant. That and, sounds like a much better future. And what you have just described is the open data movement. It's, it's, it's that. What you have just said is open the data up so everybody can now get a bit of access to it and we can, we can create more opportunities and more apps that Google aren't going to buy because that data now isn't going to be hoarded behind the walls of the big companies such as Google, uh, Amazon and so on. That's different to the idea of trading data. You could argue, for example, that if the model was now to become that we were all going going to sell this uh, data about us, uh, which we can't because it's not just about us, but anyway, uh, if, 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 if that model is now going to happen, um, I reckon pretty bloody quickly, considering that the big five have a shed ton of data already, they're going to go, I'm not paying you for that, I've already got it all. Or just, I'll make synthetic data out of what's already there. Why do I now want to start spending a whole load of money on more data that actually, arguably, I've already got? I know the locations, we can, we can make algorithms out of this. I'm not entirely sure that it's gonna go the way we think it's gonna go. Um, and I think, arguably, the idea uh, pushing that the big companies have data that could bring greater value to society as a whole and create a more uh, fluid, opportunistic uh, 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 financial environment for us by breaking those companies up and freeing that data and opening that data up so that all of us, and particularly 
the kids that are coming through who have coding ability already hardwired into them that I certainly don't have, can then go and create tools and make opportunities and app develop and all the rest of it out of the data that's now open and available, rather than trying to make money out of selling the personal data about them. Very quick question. How does that happen? Is it through the state and law? Well, that's a whole nother panel discussion. <laughs> I mean, look, there's already, there's, already there's already plenty of movement happening in terms of uh, looking at how to break the, break the big five up. Okay, I'm not an expert in that, so I'm not going to get tied into it because we're here talking about personal data, which I'm a partial expert in. Uh, um, but um, but the, I, I'm just not convinced that this model is the only model we should be we should be looking at because I, I just think they're going to turn around and go or the value that they're going to give is is, is is meaningless so why would we want to be involved and again it comes back around to the point of well for anyone for us for this potentially to even start to work we all have to do it and hey I don't want to <laughs> I'm, I, I, I don't I don't want to uh, not me <laughs> that makes two of us uh, but here's a crazy idea how about respecting data protection regulation how about forcing companies to respect privacy by design and by default. That would, from the start, eliminate a lot of the problems that we have today. How about data minimization? Whoa, that's a, that's a big one. Uh, and then, why not have machine-readable uh, pr privacy uh, policies and terms and conditions? I mean, this is a very simple first step we can do. And data portability will solve ideally, uh, a lot of the, of the problems that you, you describe when it comes to competition and, in, and innovation, because I, I am the one that um, is able to decide and to move my data from a company to, to the other very easily. Uh, what you've just said is what people are saying they, they like, they, they feel comfortable with that, they, they have belief in that, they, they, fe they feel empowered by that. Can I ask a retort question, which is, again, why hasn't that worked? It's not like we don't know about privacy. We haven't had, we've been having these debates for 20 years. Why hasn't it worked? I'm not saying that's a good reason not to pursue it. I'm just asking why strategically it hasn't worked. Why can't you get Facebook to do what you want it to do? Because the regulation is two years old. Political, and politi also, what political weakness. Like nation states around the world for the last 10 years have not believed that they could either pass law or enforce it to get the tech giants to um, come under the purview of democratic authority. It's been, it's been no, honestly, like... Is, is that weakness or is that just a lack of literacy and understanding that they're now slowly starting to get? Like, we're all now slowly starting I mean, to I, get. I mean, I have, I have listened to so many MPs and legislators over the last 10 years tell me there's nothing they can do, and it's dri driven me absolutely crazy, the idea that a sovereign nation state cannot force a company to obey the law within its own within its own constituency and for 10 years we have basically been trying to moralize the tech giants we've been telling them to act more ethically we've got so upset and we've done all this hand wringing every time they haven't they told us that theirs was a mission which was social that they you know do no evil or serve in the public conversation it's been 10 years of us trying to live up to trying to, for us to try to get to them live up to their corporate branding and it hasn't worked and in my view it's been 10 years where we of a giant red herring where we haven't done the things we needed to do which is build the entire moral architecture around these companies to mean that that whether like Mark Zuckerberg is good or bad, I shouldn't have to care about that question as much as I currently do. Like it's not like the, the, the moral, our moral fabric in the digital world is not a corporate CSR project. And if we actually draft proper law and regulation and public scrutiny and professional standards, all the things which we've done in offline life to make laws stick, then we wouldn't be in the position we are in today. And also Brexit has meant that it's just squatted on our political landscape for so long. We've barely been able to get anything else done. Can I ask another question to the panel, then? Which is, look, um, and, and look, I'm genuinely curious. If we had, could, uh, we cannot probably agree with this, uh, which is that we know that businesses sell data to other businesses. Facebook makes a lot of money from selling data to other companies, and they have the infrastructure to be able to do that. Uh, and Google Facebook and sell access to the data that they've got. It's di it's. it's Slight, it's slightly. It's slightly different. Sure, sure. Uh, I think that's a bit, um, yeah, splitting hairs maybe. But uh, they don't sell data. 
I mean, they really no, don't. They, they, they do. They also, okay, Google also sells data. Spotify also sells data. If you want information, for example, about people's playlist habits in the UK, I don't know why I'm pointing at this room, the whole of the UK, you can buy that. You can buy that tomorrow. Well, actually, you can't because you have to be permissioned and they will ask you who, they, who you are. It's not open, right? Yeah, and, and they'll, uh, they'll, they'll bill you 800,000 pounds for that, what, right? How, what, what data could I buy from Facebook? Uh, well, so no, they've changed some of their rules, but we haven't, I haven't approached them, so I don't really know what they sell. But I do know lots of companies sell data about everything, uh, lots of habits that people have in this room are up for sale. Uh, because other companies want to know, right? It's worth something. So great. So we know that businesses are selling to other businesses. That's not really in dispute. Um, the question is, uh, that I was going to ask is, would, would you be against infrastructure for individuals to do that? Why aren't you railing against businesses selling about other businesses? That's the kind of thing that well, we should I be am. I just I, I started my talk by, by railing against the shadowy data broker industry. Okay, I am railing would, against would you it. Be, would you be for the same infrastructure for individuals, right? Oh, or would you just go, that's all so bad, we should definitely not go there, but we'll, I guess we'll just have to live with the business thing and fight on that front. I don't, I don't understand the question, Shib. Like, do, do you mean I, I, if the shadowy data broker industry was instead composed of individuals doing it rather than companies, I'd be, I'd be less worried by it? Maybe, maybe that's what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> look, 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 they're, they're not, they're, they're selling access to data, it's 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 it, it isn't just about splitting hairs, but it, it, but just to come back to to Carl's point, ten years, argh, yeah, likewise, uh, same same. I've been fighting the same battles, but. My point about literacy is actually really important. First of all, let's not think that policymakers are the smartest people in the room. They're, they're, they're not. Policymakers are just people. They, have, um, they know some stuff, they don't know other stuff. And what we've found from the About Data About Us report is that we're all on a spectrum of our understanding, right? Some of us know a whole load of stuff about encryption and nothing about something else. People in the room were like, I understand what is happening with Google, so I use DuckDuckGo as an example of tools that are being developed that are about privacy and that people like, for example. I listened to a woman in her late 60s say, I use WhatsApp because it's encrypted. I almost fell off my chair and she explained it to me and I was like, that is sweet. Uh, finally, 10 years of my life have not been wasted. A woman in her late 60s likes to talk to her grandchildren on WhatsApp because it's encrypted. That is awesome. And that absolutely, by the way, throws fire back in the face of the Home Office who always tell us that ordinary people don't care about encryption. Ordinary people do care about encryption. It matters. We want to be safe and secure. Anyway, but the, 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 key, the key point of this is, I'm getting there, is it's not that it's been 10 years of people ignoring it. It's been 10 years of people not really truly understanding and policymakers not really truly understanding the harms that have been created that Shiv started talking about at the beginning. This hasn't been a complacency. This has been just a lack of understanding. And GDPR and Facebook Cambridge Analytica all happening within three months of each other last year have woken us all up. So I think we're now starting to shift. I'll shut up now. No, no, don't, no, I mean... I agree with you on that totally, totally, actually. I think that there's a real difference between what happened when the Snowden revelations happened to what happened when the Cambridge Analytica stuff happened. It's like a whole series set of concerns became much more mainstream. And while I agree with many of the statements on this panel about the power of GDPR and what, what's in there and what could be used, actually, you kind of need to know your way about it a bit in order to use, in, in order to use, in order to use it effectively. And... I think we've had a very lively discussion here, and, but there may be some merit in what Shiv is talking about purely because it allows people to understand a bit what, what's, go, what's going on and to try and take control over things. It might not be the answer, answer on its own, but as a understand, understanding what's going on and trying, to, and trying to change it, interesting. I think, I'm, I think it might be good to take some questions from the audience now, if anyone wants to... Hi, thanks for the panel. It's been really, really interesting. Uh, it's really, I'm really glad to hear all the different views, and it, it just goes to show how complex this matter is. Um, my question around, like, should we sell our, sell our data? It's like, why, you know, what's your argument for just completely, like, complete fencing off our data from companies? Shouldn't that create a response in companies and trying to make them more aware of the responsibility that they have and the reaction of people right now? 
as almost a counterbalance of what they're doing with our data? So that's my question. Oh boy. Um, <laughs> so when I think of the future I want to live in, um, it's not one uh, when in which I need to produce more data in order to get paid more because I earn more money. I don't want to be a part of a, a broken system, for example, like the advertising uh, business now, because the data that I will click will uh, generate more money for the companies that will transfer back to more money f for me as an individual. So for me, um, jumping into a monetization model would reinforce uh, these types of broken models. Um, and I don't want to be turned into a data producing machine. I don't want to, my actions and my behavior to be conducted by uh, profit making companies uh, because that's uh, another way of myself getting more money or more revenue. Maybe, that, so I don't want, the, see, I, I, see, I think I see the value, like lots of people do, and I think Renata does, um, in having open data to an extent, in the extent that. There's lots of metadata out there that can inform a much, uh, our, you know, people who build cities, people who build and help us live our lives in much more either convenient ways or efficient ways or productive ways so we can have more time to spend with our families or children, whatever it might be. I think that's a great world uh, to live in. What I don't want to sacrifice, like I think everyone here, and we can all probably agree on this basis, is we don't want to sacrifice privacy. Right? We don't want someone in the middle of all of this to know far more than anyone else and then be able to abuse that in X, Y, and Z ways, either by making a ton of money right, or by being supranational and basically running roughshod over sovereignty of a nation, let alone an individual, or X, Y, and Z. Right? So I think, I think we can probably all agree, can we all, all agree with that kind of vision? And I think that in a sense, the kind of, what Valentina's just said, it's kind of like, well, we already live in that horrible world where, you know, you're, you're saying, I don't want, you know, companies to be, run rough out of my privacy. I don't want to be a data producing machine. You're already a data producing machine. Only if you're really literate, really quite wealthy in many senses in that you understand and have a knowledge about the internet and how it works. I can't run a VPN, like private VPN. I can't run that. I don't think half the, you know, I had a, had a flirtation with, was it Tunnel Bear? Like, because it's convenient, but I can't set one up myself and I work for a tech company. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay, so the people on the, <laughs> it's not that high, sure. But, you know, the vast proportion of people clearly can't do that kind of a thing. And yes, there are more convenient tools like DuckDuckGo or Firefox. We should mention that because we're here in their house. Love Firefox. Uh, love, yay. Love um, Firefox. And, and other things like Brave coming along. And I think, I think I'm all for that. Let me put, say one last thing to add. But I, I think also claiming in, in this world where I have a manager who manages on my behalf my data Right? The stuff that I am already producing because I just interact with everyone here in this room digitally, right? in some way or another in my life. Great. I want a professional manager to represent me, represent my interests, and make sure that it's getting value, but also it's being used properly and ethically, and I can sort out those privacy concerns. I want that. that that's great. I want someone working for me, and I want the infrastructure to be able to do that. Just to, just to back Shiv up very briefly, I mean, like, no, no, honestly, no, I, I, think, I, I think it's an important point. Like, he's totally right. There are, the services that surround us that we expect to work can only work when they get data. I mean, we get so many efficiencies all the time through good data use. My, and I have, no, I have no problem with that. I really don't, despite my earlier rant. Um, my problem is that if practically speaking, where most of, anyway, the data that I found about myself, and I'm willing to bet that most people have about them as well, has tumbled not only outside of our control, but actually outside of our knowledge. Most of the data that I think exists about us has been derived and created and recreated and recombined by companies that we've never heard of before. It's that kind of data. We, I get no value from that. There are no services get in, that get improved by that. I've never given my permission for that data to be collected. By saying that you, you would give permission for to collect data about you. You would sign it away every single No, this is, this is, this is metadata. I have... Yes. That's third party gathering of that data when you go on any website. It's, it's not direct, it's not data, it's not data which is, no honestly, 
it's, 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 not, it's not data which is actually directly about anything that I've done. It's my characteristics. It's yes, things like indulgence the, score. Yeah, that's the behavioural stuff that is gathered through cookies, through your interaction. It's not cookies. It, it, it's not cookies. It's socio-demographic data. It's data yes. to do with my, uh, some of its consumption data, probably. Yes, absolutely. This is the data that it does sit under GDPR, as well as under the privacy and, and electronic um, blah, 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 regulation, PECA. Uh, this, this, is, this is exactly the point. What you've described is exactly what people are genuinely upset about being gathered. It is data that has never been gathered about us and collected and shared in the way that it is now. But you have given your permission. You have. When you read the terms and conditions, if you bother to read the terms and conditions, and yes, well, we all I, famously I, I, I know that a lot of them are about this length of Hamlet and so on, you have given permission for I that to I have not given meaningful not, consent. No, that, I have not and, given meaningful right, consent. And that's the actual, all right, that's so, the all right, really so, so don't pull me up on that then. That <laughs> totally is the important, that, 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 that is the important point. I've never given meaningful, informed consent for anything to happen. Any consent architecture which has allowed these companies to do that is not a meaningful consent architecture, in my and, opinion. And that's why the consent model is arguably broken, which is another reason. Totally why we broken. probably like, can't sell broken. our data because we don't know what we'll be giving consent to. All right, let's go to another question. Right, so we actually agree that the consent architecture right. is inarguably I think, I think broken. The gen they gentleman at the back of the room, I think. Oh. What happens when the idea of assigning property rights to data enters more mainstream political discourse? And how do we preempt this um, it, because it is going to enter a more mainstream political discourse which is maybe not as informed and we're informed people and can't agree on this. Um, Valentin, you've got like a million things to say, I'm sure. I'll, I'll say something very quickly, which is that, okay, look, I'm going to put my hands up in here. I, I don't know if this experiment on data unions will work. Um, it's not just my experiment, right? It's Sharon Lanier, lots of other people doing this, but technically we're putting forward something. I think that is novel. That's nice. But I don't know if it would work. But I do want, it, if it, it could become just a meme by which people realize that their privacy is actually worth something. And if they go, you know what? My data is worth something, and I'm going to keep it private, that's also a win in my book. I'll just say that. I think we need to make a distinction between property rights for data and monetization models for data. When it comes to property rights, um, there's a a clear contradiction uh, when it comes to the very nature of data and attaching property rights to it in a traditional sense. And it's an illusion that we can fence our data off and uh, with property rights we gain more control. That's actually not true. And when it comes to how to counteract narratives uh, on, um, on property rights, um, that's that's a very big collective effort, unfortunately, uh, from all of us. Being able to shape our demands and to be very clear what we want to, what we want to achieve and what's the future we want to live in. Um, so I don't think anybody has a, a good answer to that at this point, but we're definitely, I don't know, trying at least. I think that's the reason we're all in this room, right? To find a solution to all of this. Just very, very, very quickly. You're right, and, and this is actually critical to Carl and I's, uh, disagreement. We it's not a disagreement we did. I know, right, I know, exactly. Uh, 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 about consent, right? The, the point that you make is, yes, people care, but it's complicated. And the, the key thing there is, A, it's nuanced, and B, it's about a moment in time. So this also comes back to, can we sell data? There might be a time when we sit there and go, you know what, I'm just going to have a bit of a dabble around on this here stream of thing, and I'm going to, oh, I don't mind that stuff. I don't mind them having those tweets. That's fine. And you put it out there, and you get your 50 quid or whatever it might be. Tomorrow, you might wake up, and something might have happened happened, you know, the, 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 the government might have changed or um all of a sudden, that company that you're praising has been busted for actually being really crappy with people's data. And you don't actually want that tweet that you put out there to be out there. Now you can't just delete it because you've been paid 50 quid for it. And it's already out there and you now can't pull, pull it back. So yes, people do care about their privacy. They also do care about uh, opportunity and value and getting a benefit and everything else. But as the people said to us in the report, the person I am today isn't the person I was yesterday and it's not the person I am tomorrow. I don't like having to say yes to something and not in the future being able to say no or vice versa. All right. Um, I know that we've got limited time, so I th so maybe we can take like three questions and then we'll answer them as a panel. Um, okay, gentlemen in the front row. Uh, 
you know, those data you're creating and putting out about yourself, this data that's being kind of extrapolated from that, and what the potential models or routes are for, and especially in terms of art, like creating digital art, like how do you attribute a non-corruptible identity to a file that can then, either you know when something's been copied or been replicated or, or used, you know? Good question. Um, the gentleman in the back who I said before and then didn't get past this question. If I were a lawyer of a tech company, I would say that it's a relationship process. I generate data because I use Google or I buy a product. So if I were a lawyer, I would say that uh, me as an individual, I wouldn't be able to generate data without using this. So how would you respond to this? Um, I think the issue that is technology has been much quicker, faster than our capacity to digest it and to see the repercussion that it had on our life. Issues for me is more like uh, not the opacity, not knowing like what uh, the company is doing with my data, who are they selling it for, and if they are making money, should they not share the money with me also? Great, thank you. So that was... And sort of attribution, sort of like moral rights over, over data. Really, how do we, tra how do we can we, can we mark something so it, it's sort of morally yours? Um, whether we can talk about data separate from the applications it's generated from. I have to think about that one. And um, yeah, it's, te it's not technology moving so quickly that we just don't really understand. What you know? What we what we get? What we're giving away at all in this circumstance? So, like, who would like to take which? I can I can try to tr glue together the last two brilliant questions into a single answer. So, the, the gentleman spoke about kind of the, gen the the generation of data, and it's the actual companies that are making them. So, so isn't it kind of theirs as well? And you spoke about well, the companies are generating them. How do I know what which companies are generating what? I think like you know, like. I don't do medical care on myself either, but I certainly have inalienable rights over the control and direction and nature of medical care which is being done to me. And I think that is the key thing. The key thing, my main concern is a practical one, which is that we just have such little knowledge or control over how our data is being used right now. And, and there is basically this stark choice I think we're often faced with, which is either like use a service or don't use a service. Um, and I think if there's one like, kind of practical thing which I just wish we, we could spread across society more, it's just like this, this general uplift and cognizance of where data is actually going and who's using it and why and for what, what, for what reason. And maybe then we can begin to actually begin to make real decisions, meaningful, consensual decisions over, over what value we think we might get from it and when we're willing to do it and under what terms and with what decay and over what time spans and so on. It's, and and if, if we can reach there, then maybe actually I will come over to Shiv's point of view and be like, if we can become more powerful, knowledgeable traders in this deal, like which I think actually collectively coming together with some kind of data solidarity is probably the way, one of the ways of doing that, then, 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 you know, then, then that is actually genuinely a step in the right direction. But for me, the main worry is that tech here like, acts as a real camouflage to power. What's really happened is a huge transfer of power and control. And it's kind of hidden by these services and the opacities that complex technology is kind of, has, has kind of layered on top of it all. Can, um, I'll try and take your question briefly. Look, property rights and, and viewing, and then, and, you know, we've asked, asked this question already in the evening a few times in a few different ways. You know, who owns the moral, the, the property rights of a photo, but then there's also the moral rights, right? So if I, in law, if I take a photo of you, I own it as a piece of property, uh, but you have a moral right to object to its use. So you don't own it as a piece of property, but you have moral rights. And it gets, and, and actually, that part of law is fairly well regulated, so most people just don't confront it, right? It's mainly, I mean, in my past life as a reporter, that's when you confront it, right? Because you're like, can we use this photo? And actually, most of the time, you've run roughshod over it as a reporter before, because it's in the public interest, yada, yada, yada. Um, again, celebrities 
have made most of that law. I'm not saying that in a bad way or pejorative way. I'm saying that's just where power has sat when it's come to privacy in this country, in the UK especially. Um, we've had otherwise weak privacy laws for ordinary people. Uh, rich people, though, different set of laws in many ways. Um, so it's complicated, absolutely. But I think there are places to start. And I think I'd rather start there than not at all, because it's all too complicated, because there are some problems deep in the middle. Um, Maybe to answer your question very briefly, uh, I hate the free service model in many ways. Look, I, I know that it's useful for many billions of people across the world who don't have an income to be able to use, but for most people uh, in the West who do have enough to pay for these services, I hate what it's created, which is actually these people are pirates, right? If you want to now traverse the high seas of communications, you will be faced with some form of piracy from Google or Facebook or Netflix or Spotify and the list goes on and on and on and they'll come up to you and go, stick a knife to your throat and go, give us your data, that's your consent model, right? Give us your data, just tick here, but you, they've got a knife to your throat and then, okay, go on, now you can talk. Now you can email, now you can listen to music. I don't like that, I hate that, I hate that. I want to end that model. It's not even, it's not even just about free services now. Spend two grand on a smart TV, that's not the end of it. Now, you, that smart TV is going to know everything you watch, listen to your conversations and all the rest of it. Buy, buy an Alexa, buy a smart light bulb, buy that ding-dong doorbell thingamajig. The whole internet of things, hyper-connectivity, that's... If you don't want this, you've got to, you've got, you've got to, you've, you've got to turn it off. Um, we're going to ask if anyone's got an Alexa. Anyone here got an Alexa? All right. Are you going to... Are you going to turn your Alexa off now? <laughs> because it's an easy way for me to play my music on the speakers and find out the weather, and I just don't care. <laughs> <laughs> so let's 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 this is quite this is actually this is a really super important point coming back to this these technologies are all called smart technologies these technologies start off dumb what makes them smart is you it's your data but can you then sell it because that's not just your data that's everyone who comes around to your house's data when somebody pops around to your house do you say hey joe stephanie I'm guessing you've got some friends called Joe and Stephanie. Come around. By the way, I've got an Alexa, and all of our conversations tonight are probably going to be are going to be listened to, waiting for the for that. Are you cool with that? Do, do you ask them that? It, Re Renata, if your friend comes to your house, gives you a painting, goes to the toilet, and leaves their urine in your toilet, <laughs> do they get to claim your house? <laughs> because it's, it's your house. It's your property. That is literally the win. <laughs> right. I've ever had in ten years. Let me extrapolate Can I take the, the piss out of my toilet as well out of a swimming right. pool? No, it's because we're back. very... No, but it's a... It's a <laughs> What's the painting got to do with anything? Let me try and extrapolate. So they give you a painting, right, and then you stick it on your wall, right? It's Why a bit, have they gone to the toilet? Right, well, because they, like, they like you enough to hang around for more than an hour and they've got weak bladders. What can I say? Because you've given them tea and they urinate. Oh, did I sure. charge them for the tea? But I mean, the, surely the, the I mean, point the is, thing, actually, you, can, you <laughs> can have exactly the same conversation about who owns your house. It's just that you don't, right? Because it's settled. Who owns your house? Well, it's sat on land that is actually owned by someone else before. It's got historic import. Lots of people have been... You didn't I... build your house. Someone else built it. Well, did they contribute to the... Yes, of course they did. Well, well then what about the but state agent? But a house is a tangible blah, 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 thing. Blah, 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 Data is actually quite abstract. No, it's not. Only because we've made it abstract. It's Ooh. very tangible because it comes out in the bank balances and the power and all, all of those relationships that we see. Those are all tangible things. When Mark Zuckerberg... It's not literally tangible. Mark Zuckerberg's a real person. <laughs> it might be real, but I mean, it's not literally tangible. <laughs> right. That's exactly right. You know, that... But, but... I, I mean, that's the best question. <laughs> I still... What's the painting of? Do, I mean, you know... <laughs> But, 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 the point, but the point does come back round uh, to that. You have devices, we, we all have devices in our homes that are set to listen all the time. Uh, so that's a choice that 
we have made and we've had hopefully conversation with our families about. But people visiting the house, uh, is that, is, should we ask them? If, as part of the work that, that I've been talking about earlier, um, one of the women said to us, we've got an Alexa at home, I really like it, um, but I was fiddling around on my Amazon account the other day and I realized that it recorded all these random conversations that my partner's little girl had had and it freaked me out. And I said, okay, so what do you do? She said, well, I deleted them and it was because I found it really unnerving because like, she's just going around chatting. She's having little conversations with Alexa. But I then had read in the newspaper that that was them being analyzed and being kept by Amazon. I didn't realize that that was happening. So then I said to her, okay, um, do you now turn Alexa off whilst your little girl's awake and only use it in the evenings? Because she basically said, it's not cool because my little girl didn't choose Alexa. I'm a grown up and I understand the relationship I've got and I'm okay with that. And so we said, you know, do you turn it off when your little girl's out up and about? And she's like, no, but we have told her, you know, maybe she shouldn't be chatting away with it. So we're all finding ways of handling this engagement. But the point coming all the way back round is this, I, about your point about free services. It's, it's not even about that anymore. It's about every product we buy that is connected is gathering data on us. So, you know, we're already paying for it as well in that angle. There's more interesting questions. Oh, shut up. Yeah, and what are we optimizing towards? I mean, it's obvious what companies are optimizing towards, but what do we want to optimize for as a society? And will the fact that, um, to, to uh, come back to one of the questions, will the fact that companies uh, come pay me some money, will, it, will this really solve our problems? Will this really solve data exploitation and bad data practices? Will the fact that I receive whatever amount of money really change everything? Yes, lady, lady in the front here. I have a problem with this, because this, uh, this whole idea of the right to monetize, right, consumer sovereignty of our data, all of this, right? This, we're talking about pennies in terms of the big macro picture around the value of what our data is. Surely the kind of the threat here is about the desiccation of the welfare state. It gets down to the level that if you go to Moorfields Eye Hospital and you get a retina scan, DeepMind that's owned by Google has taken the data of 9 million NHS patients to build proprietary software that the NHS will eventually have to buy back from Google, right? It will sell that, it will sell that proprietary software across the world. And, and so this is, connected, this is more a macro problem, a structural problem to do with how governments regulate this. And we can have this endless debate about what do I do, how can I, and we all get depressed and there's nothing we can actually do and we're data gatherers, I understand that. But really the, the key issue here is the macro picture and the governments have realized actually the ownership of these data platforms, the amount our data is generating in terms of wealth for these uh, you know, American companies, so unicorns worth billions that who are avoiding tax, who then will be able to control our education, our transport, our health, and destroy the welfare state as we know it because they're not even paying their taxes. So I don't really care if I'm not paying, I'm not getting money, I'm not getting you know, 50p every month from Google for, or for because I've searched it or something like that. I'm caring that Google and Facebook are not paying billions to try and help me maintain a well, the welfare state we've all fought in, in building in Europe. I think that's where situating this conversation to where it lies, locating it within the broader issue, helps us understand why this is a problem for us. That's kind of the point that I was trying to make earlier about open data. So that it's, it's, it's about uh, uh, break, getting the big companies to open data up, to make it available for all of us to be able to access and build from so that we can create a more vibrant uh, 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 marketplace. We can create better decisions in society. You know, all, your, point is, your point is perfectly accurate. I, uh, that I am aware I'm doing a project at the moment about open cities, right? Not smart cities, open cities. There is so much data that is already out there that cities don't even know that they've already got, but they're being encouraged to buy sensors to create yet more data uh, to make decisions about things that a private company is suggesting they should make decisions about. Obviously, Uber holds a whole lot of data that's really valuable. You, you were talking earlier about um, New York, which maybe might be of interest. Google holds a whole lot of data. Facebook ho hold a whole lot of data that could be really useful for helping cities make better decisions for better environments for all of us to live in uh, uh, um, that, that, that would create a more uh, egalitarian is that the right word? Uh, a, 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 more, um, a, a more vibrant society for all of us, rather than them harvesting it, holding it, and making money off of it. So um, join the open data movement. <laughs> I think there is, a, there is value in 
differentiated between the different the problem of data and data monitoring and data collection and the problem of monopoly. A monopoly is a separate problem. It's one we used to care about at one point. Yeah, it's a, yeah, it's a, it's just the define, defining big problem. And a lot of what we're talking about is about overwhelming, in a, you know, inappropriate market market power, and that's not necessarily a question just you know just about just about data. That's a question about something else and devices that maybe we've not regulatory devices that maybe we've not looked at for many many years. Okay. Oh, did you want to? Sorry, Chef. I could hop in. I, look, I think that's a fascinating thing, and I think there are lots of different ways to sort of tackle. Like, you know, we all know that DeepMind and Google are going to uh, harvesting our information to teach their computer, as you put it beautifully, to then, it will then, we'll be paying for that in the end, right, in some way, and they'll be sitting at the heart of a massive innovation which was built by us. Right, how do you solve that? Do you, do, you, do, you, do you just appeal to their ethics? No, it, clearly big companies don't understand ethics because they've been completely unethical. Literally, Google's tagline was don't do evil, and what did they do? They're doing it right now, right? So that doesn't work, but they do understand, they do understand money, they do understand property rights, and they do understand, actually, you know what, what makes sense to me is, fine, they're gonna do it, Either we stop them and outlaw it, or we say, hey, we all built this. Um, whatever it earns, we own a share of that. And, and as they go on to make money from it, it becomes a cooperative. And that, I love that. I love that idea. That's how it should be, because I don't think you can stop it. And some innovations will be amazing. We'll all benefit from those innovations. I want the bottom line to also go to everyone here. If you don't want that 50p, great. Give it to charity. At a click of a button. I'm talking about equity. So the NHS should yeah. have equity in deep my health, right? The NHS should have owned 5%, 2%. But you, the way they I want technology to make sure that you have equity. What's the sell the data? I think the state needs to regulate and say, well, if you want, I, don't forget governments. I'm all for the open data movements, but states have, probably own more data than, than, you know, they don't know what to do with it because data exploitation, this is, this is why I have problems with the open data movement. Data exploitation requires um, investment and resources. You're going to extract the data of 4 billion users or 3 billion, I don't know how, it works, how many users Facebook has, right? Across the world, who has the power to ex exploit and analyze and build and innovate with that data? It's these American companies. No one, no, no one has the capacity so, to do anything with that data. You're generating right. it. You're at, you're, right, that's abs yeah. absolutely. So again, uh, there's lots of, nothing is perfect. There is. There is a whole lot of work that's coming out, partly from the IDI, but from others, about the concept of data trusts, for example, which isn't about financial, it's not about creating money, it's about people feeling, uh, or organizations that are creating data, feeling they don't want it to be uh, used solely by the big giants, that they want to put it in an environment, they, they want to be able to open it up and give access to it from people who have startups, uh, who want to solve the illegal wildlife trade, for example, or do health, or uh, use personal, some people might want to put personal data about them in there so that it can be used by health startups to be able to start to train algorithms, right? There is a whole movement and a whole thought process going around data trusts. It's got lots of different names, data cooperatives. They're all slightly different models. They're all, they're, they, 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 there's not one off the shelf model that you can take. But the point is, is lots of people feel the way you do. Uh, and there is, there is a movement and a thought process to try and improve that situation. It's one strand of it. Breaking up the big companies is another strand of it. Um, I'm not entirely sure. I mean, data unions may be a strand of it too. Too, but that's about, this is about money uh, and whether we should be paid for it or whether we should just put data about us that we feel we have some sense of control over and put it out there so that it can be used without financial gain but for societal gain. Um, I think we've got time for question. one last question before we go and get drinks, which is very important. It's not even just the data, it's that the, this data is being weaponized against us to target us with addictive content and that's the basic problem, like when you give away this data. And then what stop? What's stopping you from, for governments to target you? We've seen what's happening in China versus what's happening in the US. And then this is the major problem that lies if they start monitoring you on that basis. And when you say the things about, oh, you don't know how to set up a VPN, then there's this fact about literacy, right? You need this literacy. You can't be like, if someone doesn't know, let's just start exploiting them. Because that would, like she mentioned, the NHS records. It wasn't even the records that were, so for innovation, you would need data and the, things like to train these models. But the thing was they were identifiable patient records. And people who are making these laws, they need this 
They need the knowledge, they need to understand these things. And where does that come in? If something is wrong, at least legislation is trying to make it difficult, and we need literacy for it. At least legislation, legislation makes it difficult. American companies cannot get away with doing what Chinese companies are doing so easily. At least it makes it difficult. And what we would be doing by giving our data, by selling it, is the fact that making it super easy for them, it is already costing them money to get the data, so they wouldn't mind buying it from us because they pay lawyers to avoid the laws, and they're paying data scientists to extract that insights. And what we're going to give them is much more accurate data, which is going to be much more useful to them. So I don't know, what do you guys think about that? It's like... A couple of you suggested that encryption is, equals privacy, and I think that's a complete fallacy, and people that think that uh, often have a very false sense of security uh, that they have privacy when they absolutely don't. So privacy and encryption are two entirely separate things. Um, I think underpinning a lot of this, uh, you've almost touched on it but not quite got there, is trust. If there's going to be a sort of service where I can, say, sell my data through a broker, I've got to trust a, data, uh, a broker to hold my data. So what you've, not, you've talked around but not got to is, so how do you establish trust online? Because without that, the rest of it is just hot air. Um, there's also, it's also a separation between, I think, real-time data and static data. Um, lots of the world at the moment has been built on, um, lots of these kind of data businesses built on static data, because uh, real-time delivery, so this is actually just a technical answer, is actually really quite difficult um, until fairly recently. So, you know, it's a difference between Experian, which is basically a bunch of static files, and, say, Twitter, or, like, Visa giving you access to their API, right? Um, and I think when you come to real-time delivery, you get to a much more interesting place because actually the ownership doesn't mean anything and passing and, and being and trusting the data doesn't quite hold the same value because you're, you're basically uh, building pipes uh, and that's what the, man in, the person in the middle is doing. You're building a pipe to someone else to lease, and this is important, you can't actually really buy the data, you're leasing it. And when that lease term ends, then that data cuts off. Now, they can store it, sure, and anyone has the ability to do that. Um, even now, you could sit there storing all the tweets that appear on your timeline. It's just quite difficult, unless you have API access. But when you get into a real-time situation, which all data will eventually, very, and I say eventually, very soon will just be that. The static files won't make much sense, because um, it'll be at the edge that you'll find the insights. That's when I think you get to a much more interesting situation where I lease you access to the API and the trust thing starts to sort of fade away. Um, that's a bit of a waffly answer because it's, it's technical, but you probably know more than I do. Um, there's no such thing as 100% security. There's no such thing as 100% privacy. There's no such thing as 100% of trust either. Uh, and yeah, uh, that, it, that's kind of the answer to all three of your, your points. <laughs> Uh, there's three certainties in life, uh, 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 death, taxes, and surveillance. <laughs> uh, um, but uh, I, I, anyway, um, I, I, the trust point is really interesting. It comes back around to the, to the, the, the response I gave to the lady over here, um, data trusts. So it's about a set of principles. It's, uh, it's about governance. It's about independence. It's, about, it's not necessarily about financial. It's about having, uh, putting some, uh, an organization uh, in the middle of, of a transaction to ensure that each party can have uh, 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 an element of trust. Um, but this is the work that's this, its starting points, its thought processes. So I, I just wanted to give you a sort of slightly silly answer, but a truthful answer as well. I think um, this is like more departing thought. Than a, than, a, than a thing, but I'll, I'll do it anyway. I, I, think, I think one of the kind of great ironies of our age is that a world which is increasingly datafied is also increasingly mysterious. Like data is obscuring and camouflaging things as much as it's actually revealing them. Um, only when the New York regulatory authorities got the data from Uber did they learn that 97% of the, of the drivers were earning under minimum wage. And I reckon there are examples like that absolutely everywhere, and we don't know about them yet. So my final thing is we only will be able to control and make decisions and sell or not whatever we do with our data when we actually know this kind of stuff. And all of us have to find ways, I think, of shining the light into the ways in which data actually makes us less knowledgeable about the things that reach into and shape our lives. 
yeah. Uh, how about a model um, that removes stress from the equation? Can we design such a model? Um, one idea would be first to apply all the principles that I talked about at the beginning, like privacy by uh, defi de default and by uh, design processes, data minimization, um, fierce enforcement of the current rules. I'm not sure that that was mentioned in our talk. Um, big part of, of the equation as well. Data portability will solve a lot of uh, issues uh, when it comes to us seeming, uh, seamlessly moving uh, data from one point uh, to another and also fostering innovation in companies and, and competition. Um, and if, an, if, it, if we want to go uh, further, um, we could design a model where we have, um, as a first step, um, access uh, through APIs for our data, and that would that would mean that we will have all the uh, rights in the GDPR um, enforceable on a technical level. Then we can have interoperable um, APIs so that we can uh, move data from a centralized company to a decentralized one or to another centralized company uh, based on our preference. And then if we want to go really, really uh, further, uh, we can completely separate uh, the data layer uh, uh, from the service layer, which means that if I post something on Facebook, it will not be Facebook that will host the data, it will be somebody else. It can be um, an, another hosting provider or it can be a decentralized model. Um, there are, of course, a lot of um, elements to discuss uh, when it comes to this new data ecosystem. Um, but we really need to explore this because we, we can't leave it uh, to concentration of power and data monopolies, which I heard very uh, clearly today that these are the problems that really affect us and not the fact that uh, we are not getting paid uh, for the data that we generate. Okay, final thought. Maybe Valentina should have said this ages ago. Like, Streamer is an open source project that's peer to peer, that runs a peer to peer network that's encrypted and decentralized. I could have won you over ages ago, maybe. I don't know. No, we're still going to disagree. Um, but look, I want to live in a damn rat. So go on, you want to? No, we'll talk about it afterwards. You need the, we need wine. We all need wine. It's there, it's sitting right there. Um, uh, very briefly, uh, Jaron Nania has a phrase uh, data dignity. Um, I think it's, you know, he's fleshed it out. I think that sounds something that we'd all sign up to. Um, I like that we have very different means and ways to get to that place but it's worth keeping i like that phrase i want i want that i want that and i think that's a line we can all all agree on and thank you all for coming i want to thank a really excellent panel and i think we could have talked for hours and hours and hours and hours but there is wine over there so i think we should drink it thank you <laughs>